It's a very special friend of mine, my very favorite little pal. Oh, rubber ducky, you're the one. You make bath time lots of fun. Rubber ducky, I'm awfully fond of you. Bo -bo -bo -dio. Origins of the rubber duck actually lie deep underground in oil reserves. All plastic comes from oil, and so we thought that oil would be a great place to start. Oil is extracted from the ground um, through wells. A company will drill a well, and then the pressure inside the well pushes the oil out of the top, or out of the well. Um, that only accounts for about 10% of the oil, though, because the pressure in the well will go down. So companies use other methods, such as pumps or repressurizing the well, in order to extract more oil. Now while there's lots of issues that we could talk about with the extraction of oil, with its use as gasoline, we felt like it'd be more important to talk about the production of oil and the political consequences that can come from that production. Because oil is such an important commodity in today's society, you would imagine any country which could produce oil would see great economic benefits from that production. However, what we've seen is that when oil is produced in developing countries, um, that oil money is concentrated and democracy is repressed and economic growth is depressed um, as a result. We wanted to talk about this further, so we decided to talk with Professor, Professor Steve Sharp about it. Uh, there is a lot of literature that talks about how any kind of extractive resource is a net negative for a developing country. Uh, what I mean by a, a net negative, of course, everyone wants to sell the resource, and that sounds great. But if the co economy is dependent on that extractive resources, there's lots of problems. First of all, uh, when the government and the economy can just get money out of the ground, as it were, that destroys incentives for other kinds of industries. Second, it will also make any kind of local industries less competitive if they have a huge source of income coming in, it will change their exchange rate, making their local domestic industries less competitive. Third, um, governments are more corrupt in those kind of situations because it's easy for them to command the revenue if it's from a single source. Fourth, they usually don't have to tax the local people because they can get all the money that they need from this extractive revenue. Well, that sounds great, except the people then no longer expect government to perform to a certain level because they're not paying for it. In other words, they don't have a vested interest. They're more likely to tolerate corruption or think that's the status quo or whatever. There's not this dynamic inter play between the population and the government. So, if you're an individual country dependent on this, and particularly if you're a country that doesn't have Saudi Arabia's luxury of being able to produce oil for thirty dollars a barrel, well, you, and if you're all, all, your whole revenue stream, the whole government is dependent on that, and the price drops in half, you are in real trouble. Unrest is a real problem. So say you have a particular area of the country that has the revenue being produced, the oil or whatever. For example, Ni Nigeria in the 60s, Biafra, that's where most of the oil was located. The Biafrans decided they didn't want the rest of Nigeria benefiting from what they considered their resources. So they rebelled, tried to declare independence and so forth. Uh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria, are benefiting from the oil that just you know that's in those places and they can finance their insurgency their rebellion and so forth so for those reasons they call that a resource curse 
If you're not developed already, you're going to probably hinder your chances of economic development, political development, democratization, all those kinds of things that make for a good market economy. Wow, we can see that oil money actually can have a really negative effect on developing countries. But is oil production or oil money itself bad? If we look at the case of Norway, we come to a very different conclusion. Norway discovered oil in the North Sea in 1969, and it transformed their economy. During the 1970s, education employment doubled, and then health and service sector employment quadrupled in that time. And their economy grew a lot because of the oil money. It accounts today for about 30% of government revenues. Now, you might wonder why it is that Norway um, had a different result than, than um, other developing countries. Norway is very humanitarian and is deeply concerned with the welfare of their citizens. Um, and so because of that, they spread that oil money rather than concentrating it. The conclusion we draw from this then is that it is not oil or oil money that does a country wrong. It's bad governance combined with that oil production of money that leads to the negative outcomes politically and economically for the developing countries that are producing oil. Rubber ducks are made of polyvinyl chloride, or PVC plastic. PVC plastic is a very strong and rigid plastic. Polyvinyl chloride is made by combining ethylene, a product of oil, and chlorine. This combination creates ethylene dichloride, which is then transformed into vinyl chloride. The vinyl chloride is then polymerized to create polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. In order to create the rubber duck, PVC pellets are melted down at extremely high temperatures. The PVC is combined with plasticizers to achieve the desired properties, and then it is forced into a mold. High pressure air is blown into the mold to make the rubber duck hollow. The rubber duck is then cooled down with water and is released from the mold. Almost all rubber ducks are manufactured in China. According to a U.S. Department of Commerce report in 2012, approximately 88% of all children's toys were manufactured in China. PVC plastic by itself is not harmful to humans, but vinyl chloride, the product that is polymerized to make PVC, has been found to be harmful to humans. Vinyl chloride has been linked to a specific kind of liver cancer, and workers that are exposed to vinyl chloride have a higher risk of getting liver cancer. In addition, many of the plasticizers that are used in the production of PVC plastic have been found to be dangerous to human health. Several different respiratory diseases, cancers, and other health defects have been linked to specific plasticizers. As a result, many regulations have been passed in order to ban certain uses of plasticizers in the manufacture of children's toys. For example, the EU banned six specific plasticizers in the manufacture of plastic toys. And then in 2007, a study was conducted to see how many plastic toys contain traces of these banned plasticizers. As it turns out, 27% of the toys still contain these banned plasticizers. Plasticizers, you may think that they're just a small part of the PVC plastic, but plasticizers actually make up 50% of the weight of the plastic product. Because plasticizers are not bound to the plastic polymers in which they are first formed, throughout time and throughout the use of the product, these plasticizers can find their way out of the product and into the environment. These released plasticizers can be found in the ground we walk on, in the water we drink, and even in our own bloodstream. The most common and most dangerous plasticizer of all is DEHP. It accounts for 73% of all additive production. DEHP is the most dangerous because of many reasons. Studies have shown that DEHP is a probable carcinogen as rodents exposed to high doses of DEHP have developed liver tumors. Other studies have shown that prolonged exposure to DEHP may play a role in causing reproductive disorders in both males and females. Now I know these are all extreme circumstances and they sound very scary, but DEHP risks are real and are increased under the following circumstances. First of all, the longer that you are exposed to DEHP, the higher the danger is for you. 
Second of all, research shows that the younger you are, the more dangerous it is for you. And finally, DEHP leaks out even faster out of plastic when it is exposed to water, and even more in hot water. So in other words, we're taking the most vulnerable population and we're putting them in the most susceptible of circumstances in the bathtub, which is where the rubber duck lives. Now there are many issues with the creation, the manufacture, and the use of plastic, but perhaps the biggest issue with plastic is the amount of waste there is in the world. U.S., Japan, and Europe are estimated to produce 50 million tons of plastic waste every year. This plastic waste ends up in landfills, it's recycled, or it's converted into other energy. A study by Columbia University estimated that 82% of plastic waste ends up in landfills, 7% is recycled, and the remaining 11% is converted into other forms of energy. The problem with sending plastic to the landfill is twofold. First of all, plastic is not biodegradable. Second, we have a limited amount of space in our landfills today. Studies have found that only 1 to 3% of the hydrocarbon content in plastics is degraded in 100 years in the landfill. In addition, plastics and other waste in landfills releases 18% of the total U.S. methane emissions which is a significant greenhouse gas. In recent years, there has been a big push to recycle more plastics. Recycling sounds really good in theory, but it is much more complicated than you might imagine. First, the plastic needs to be separated. There are many different types of plastic. If plastics are combined in the recycling process, then it can decrease the quality of the recycled plastic in the end. For example, if one piece of PVC plastic is combined with a thousand pieces of another type of plastic, it can ruin the quality of the entire plastic because of the high chlorine content in PVC. In addition, plastic can only be recycled three to four times before you can't recycle it once again. And this is just about plastics in general. Recycling PVC is much more complicated because PVC plastic is not very valuable once it has been recycled. Also, PVC plastic is one of the cheapest plastics to make in the first place. So manufacturers often face the dilemma of choosing plastic that has been recycled, which may be more expensive, or virgin plastic, which is cheaper and a higher quality. Besides recycling or the landfill, plastic can be turned into other forms of energy. Recently, scientists have developed a technology to turn plastic back into oil. Non-recycled plastic actually stores more energy than coal and it falls just behind natural gas and oil for the amount of energy per pound. This is done by heating the plastic in the absence of oxygen, which doesn't release any greenhouse gases. The plastic is then turned into oil, which can be used to create gasoline for cars or a number of other things. So, as you can see, We've followed the life cycle of a rubber duck in full circle. From raw materials of oil deep down in the ground and surrounding political issues, to the dangers of producing and using a rubber duck. And finally, we explained how a rubber duck can be disposed into a landfill, recovered into renewable energy, or recycled back into PVC plastic. So is the rubber ducky a terrible product? Should we be worried about using plastic in our daily lives? It's hard to make a judgment on the rubber duck. Plastic is such an important material in our modern society. Um, it's so important to everything we do. It makes cars lighter. It allows them to be more fuel efficient. There's all kinds of benefits that come from using plastic that, that we didn't have before. Uh, this isn't a judgment on the rubber duck, but its story, its life may be more complicated um, and some might say sinister than what we may have originally imagined.